George and I have talked about doing this for a number of years, but it was just a, you know, one presentation about China. The way that you're developing right now to be integrated into that just thrills me. Now, I did have to violate some of my basic principles as a Rice graduate. This is the first time I've been on the A&M campus. <laughs> Donna, coincidentally, even though it's a Chinese, I bought it for her because it's her colors for Oklahoma State. So, you know, you're looking at a couple, a well, former rival, not too much, and a real rival <laughs> by one point, I think. Um, you know, it's been quite an experience, and I'll go through as fast as I can. Every, every project is a separate story. I could write a book on every project. Different experiences, the people that we've worked with, just the great whole uh, experience of the cultural interchange. We started in 1993, but in 1990, I hired a young Chinese student from the graduate program in Louvain, Belgium, in hospital design. And he wanted to come to the U.S. just for a one-year fellowship. And I thought, why not? So we negotiated a deal, brought him to Memphis. He and his wife came. After one year, they said, you know, we really like it. And so we don't want to go back. So I helped them get H-1 visas, subsequently green cards. And they worked with us for 10 years before going to Atlanta for about three and then going back to China. But he came to me one day in 93. He said, I never would have suggested this in 1990 because China wasn't open. And it was only one year after the Tiananmen incident, which is one of the reasons they weren't real excited about going back. But he said, if you're interested, my wife's parents and my parents, all four of them were doctors, physicians in Shanghai. And a lot of my friends, college classmates, are now in the leadership positions at ACADI, which is one of the big 10 state design institutes, state-owned design institutes. So he said, are you willing to invest in a two weeks? And I said, sure, let's go. So we made a two-week trip to Shanghai. ICADI helped us organize seminars at their office for Chinese hospital managers. Back then, we had 35 millimeter slides, you know. But everything was translated, dual language. And it was all about how we planned and designed hospitals in the U.S. Didn't know anything about China then. We came back with a contract for a new 250-bed hospital in Shanghai. I mean, nobody's ever had that kind of marketing success. <laughs> and Kay and I, Wang Kai, we just worked together great. And so we started winning some competitions, getting some more work, and we just had at least one or two projects in the office all the time. So that's why I was traveling back and forth. And a total of 29 planning and design projects since 1993. Now, nine of those were competitions that we entered and didn't win. But you basically do a full concept design. So you've designed it, even though you don't get to see it built. The other 20 have been, we've been paid for, and then some have not been built, but I've got a summary at the end that will show you. In 1996, we opened a representative office so we could actually have Chinese business cards and say we had a presence in China. And we hired another graduate from Louvain, Belgium, that was one of Kay's classmates to be our office manager there. And we really had a lot of success, won a lot of work. And then in 2002, Wang Kai and his wife said, you know, we want to go back to China. We've always wanted to come back to China. The private practice of architecture wasn't even legal in 1993. But they went back, started their own practice, and then became our alliance partner. And we worked really successfully. And then I got the bad news in 2009 that RTKL was buying him. <laughs> and I see he's going to be on the presentation with RTKL. So the work I'm going to show you is work that he and I largely did together with our staff support. I don't know what he's going to show you because he's got a lot of work he's done on his own through his own uh, company and then now with RTKL. And then we most of the work in recent years was done under the TRO Jung Brandon, and that's what I'm going to show you. You see the cities. I mean, I tell people we've worked from Chengdu to Xiamen, from Beijing to Shenzhen, you know, and that's a pretty broad spread. And in China, much as any international work, unless you actually have a presence there, we don't go much beyond the concept or schematic design. A couple of jobs, we've actually gone into design development, which was great, did equipment layouts and so forth and so on. 
but the Chinese are just not used to footing those kinds of bills. And the, the disparity between Chinese fees and American fees are about 10 to 1. So the Chinese clients are willing to spring for that premium on the first 10 to 15 percent of the work, but not on the whole job. So every job we have a Class A licensed Chinese design institute that produces the construction documents. When we had the alliance with Kay's firm, which was AHS, he was kind of in that in-between stage where we could take it in the design development, working with him, and then hand it off to the design institute. But because he was there, he could actually become, worked almost as part of our firm. Just some thumbnails. The first job we did was this little hospital in, in Shanghai. They got the structure up. It's right on the expressway going to the airport, so I saw it every time I landed. And they stopped construction, covered it in green cloth, and ran out of money, just left it there. It's now a nightclub and a hotel. But it's there. <laughs> and then just the East Hospital, I'll show you, the Children's Hospital in Tianjin, another project that got all the way up through the structure in Chengdu, and then they stopped. A small project to renovate the old Beijing International School for the Beijing United Family Hospital. And Kay's just finished another project on his own working with them. A big cancer hospital for a private developer in Hong Kong whose offices was the top of the Ali and Pei's Bank of China building. But the, some of those didn't get built. Uh, first teaching hospital in Chengdu. The, we actually did one school that's built in Pudong. It was right at the end of the subway line when they first started uh, building it out to Pudong. Third Central Hospital in Tianjin. Uh, the Shaman Fu Pan Hospital is one that we were working on with Shaman University and Harvard. Harvard was going to put its brand name on the medical school and the hospital, but the university got timid, ran out of money, and they didn't build it. Uh, Chan Ching, a private developer, was going to do this job. And we had a wonderful design, had a great site in Chan Ching, uh, didn't get built. Women's Hospital in Shaman didn't get built. But we got paid for the design. So here's some of the jobs that we did. Uh, get paid for and got built. The first job was the Shanghai East Hospital. And as you'll see in the background, that's SMO's Genmo Tower. So this is a huge, prominent site. It's right across the street from the Shanghai Stock Exchange. The old hospital was on this site. A Chinese design institute had completed construction documents, and the mayor said, this design is awful. I won't allow you to build it at this corner. So they had a International design competition, seven firms, French, German, two U.S. We actually beat HOK, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you had to work around and build it in phases, kind of keeping the hospital in operation until it was finished. And then when it was finished, it was all new. Right next to this now is the uh, Asian Financial Center, the KPF project. And if you're looking out of the glass floor of the observation deck, here's that Shanghai East Hospital. <laughs> That just shows you sort of the prominence of that site for the first project we ever did. We used curves, and I'll show you why in a minute, but from the nurse's station, you really got a good view of everything. And one of the reasons we won the competition is respecting the Chinese tradition. We faced every patient room south. If you go into the countryside and you see all the residential structures, there is no living space anywhere except on the south side. The kitchen, the bathrooms, the storage rooms are on the north. And the buildings are far enough apart to never block the sun coming into the living area, habitable areas. You go into a brand new office building in China, anywhere, the foreigners are on the north side, the Chinese are on the south side. And so this is one of the reasons we were told that we won is that we developed whoop, this scheme to face all the patient rooms south, mostly three beds. This is a public hospital. We had a couple, one private and one semi-private over on the north side. But all of this met that history and that uh, experience of the culture. We actually separated elevators for the visitors from the inpatient clean elevators and again from the soiled elevators. A lot of the times you go into Chinese hospitals and all the elevators may be separate, but they dump into a common lobby. So what do people do? They come over and push every button they can find to see what kind of an elevator they can get. So these are some simple things that we did early on that really began to make a difference in the way Chinese hospitals were designed because no other foreign firm was working there. 
we even had we even had the the scheme where as you came off the visitor elevator you came into the nursing unit here and you really didn't see the back of the house space and we've done that really in every every project when we finished the East Hospital, the folks from Tianjin Children's Hospitals came to a symposium in Beijing and they said, we saw your presentation on the East Hospital. You worked around all these old buildings. Our buildings in Tianjin is a severe seismic area. Our buildings are about to fall down. The mortar in the bricks is gone. And the bricks are just resting on each other because it's an active seismic area. But we have to keep operating. So we came up with a design, worked around everything, and it was brand new when it was finished. All the you know, in China, everybody comes to the hospital for everything. There are no Walgreens, ambulatory surgery centers developing, uh, medical office buildings. Everything is here. And so you've got to handle thousands of people. I mean, there are 2,500 emergency room visits each day to this place. And so we put all the outpatient clinics in a two-story building out front that you see when you're passing by. I developed all this nice, nice garden with underground parking inpatient entrance is separate here. And we even express the inpatient towers differently just from a children's perspective to make it look smaller. And we use the horizontal banding to make it feel lower. And here's the entrance. There's a, what you don't see is the other canopy as you're walking in because the people, public cannot drive into the site. In China, they're outside the gate. So they get off the bus they get off of their somebody the taxi cab and they walk to the hospital and we had this this wonderful sort of dragon like feeling of the canopy that terminated in the dragon's head at the entrance uh, this was also in Tianjin a design competition an 800 bed teaching hospital very simple organization inpatient tower here diagnostics here the atrium and all the outpatient clinics here. So all the waiting for outpatients, whether it's diagnostic or clinics, is around the atrium. The inpatients can come down the tower and connect to the diagnostics. Outpatients can flow horizontally and connect to it. Many of the existing Chinese hospitals are individual buildings, pavilions. I mean, I've seen them take patients out of the inpatient building on stretchers and roll them down to the street to go to surgery. Emergency department is usually in the outpatient building, which means if you got somebody comes in the emergency department that needs critical care, you roll them down the street to the inpatient building and take them up to surgery. So lots of differences. And this just typically shows what we worked on. This, this last project I just showed you, this was sort of how it wound up, but it started by looking like this. And the hospital was able to empty out one building and give us this construction site. That's why these towers are offset. The only way we could build enough beds to replace the old buildings was to do that design. So that then that freed up tearing down another building and finishing it out and we even had a master plan for additional construction to the north. But working around existing structures, keeping them in operation, they don't go away while they're seeing patients. We've had a few greenfield sites. Now you're working on an eye hospital. This is a Tianjin eye hospital. It was one of the four major eye institutes in China, Beijing, Shenzhen, Shanghai, and, and uh, Tianjin. It's 200 beds, so it's one of the smallest jobs. We don't usually do something that small. We didn't as a firm because it's just not enough fee to make it worthwhile. It was a design competition. We weren't gonna compete. This was our fourth project in Tianjin, no, third project. And the healthcare bureau said, no, you have to understand something. You must enter the design competition because you're gonna win it. I mean, design competitions aren't always the way we think about them with independent juries. And we found out that for design competitions, if we don't have an existing relationship with somebody at the healthcare bureau or the hospital, we're wasting our time and we don't enter it because it's not just always that you know, what we're used to seeing with public juries and so forth. Uh, outpatient clinics, we try to keep those low so that they can be accessed by elevators and stairs because the elevators, I mean escalators, because the elevators just get jammed with people and you're dealing with so many people like a shopping mall. And it was right on a corner and this was north facing south here so we thought, gosh, you know, you hate to have the main entrance 
on the north side and in the shade all the time, but the patient rooms all face south. Outpatient clinics here, diagnostic on every floor to connect, and the top floor, because it's rectangular surgery, it's not easy to put operating rooms under a curved shape. And uh, underground parking, and here's just a, really probably the best quality construction of a job that we've had, which is another problem in China, is getting quality construction, because you don't have any control over it as an American firm. First teaching hospital in Chengdu is 4,500 beds, the largest hospital in China. The president of the hospital came to an exhibit, exhibition in actually Beijing, said, I want you to do my hospital. 1,200 bed expansion, replacing three existing buildings on the campus. 4,500 beds are in many different camp parts of the campus. And they said, I've convinced the government that I'm using hospital cash reserves to pay the architect and I don't have to do a design competition. So the biggest project we've gotten paid for that's been built, we didn't have to do a design competition. We actually sat down and wrote a program. <laughs> we met with department heads. Normally we do a competition, the design is without a very specific program and when it's done, it's done and the users may not have any say so in how it operates which is great for us. I mean, you know, don't have to worry about the head of radiology eating your design lattice. Hospital president says, here it is. Donna and I were in Italy in 2008 watching English language television in our apartment on Lake Como in May, and all of a sudden on the television is this hospital, and all of this area out in here is filled with tents and they were triaging people from the earthquake. I mean, the earthquake was like 30 kilometers from the hospital. I mean, it was very close. And we, so here we are in Italy looking at a project we did. So this was the biggest job that we had done to that point. Again, outpatient clinics at one end, inpatient block on top of diagnostic and treatment with a horizontal mall on every floor to move hundreds of people. This has 7,500 visits a day to the clinics. So you can imagine how many that is over the year. We had to work around an existing building that was built in 1997 that looked like it was about 40 years old. And as soon as the project was finished, they tore it down and filled in. <laughs> but we used an open court and light wells. We tried to in the outpatient clinic, we try to foster natural light and ventilation because, again, that's what people are used to. They're not used to these big windowless blocks. And so we limit that to the diagnostic and treatment areas. Here you can see the emergency department, uh, observation beds, uh, the treatment areas, access to the inpatient elevators here. Public comes in from this plaza through uh, a separate lobby for inpatient. You really don't want to mix those two because it's just too many people. We really had an interesting experience with this. We kept talking about and showing schemes that face south, and the president said, in Chengdu, we don't need to face everything south. The sun never shines. I mean, it literally is in a dish surrounded by mountains, and it's foggy all the time. And he said, we have this beautiful plaza out here. I want as many beds as possible to face the plaza. And we have this new road here that's going to generate a lot of noise. And so we evolved these two nursing units, there's 60 beds on each nursing unit, they're huge. The inpatient elevators, family elevators, two different nursing stations, and here we created, again, this separate corridor for the staff areas. I mean, you've heard of the Disney concept of on stage and off stage. Well, the staff in China are dealing with so many patients, the average staffing ratio per bed in China is half of what it is in the U.S., and that includes salaried positions, and it includes the outpatient clinics. So every person's taken care of 10 times the number of people that somebody in the U.S. is taken care of, and they need a place to get away. So every job, we've been able to incorporate that. Here's just one of the outpatient waiting rooms. Here's that nurse's station. We didn't envision that it was going to look like this when it got finished. And this is the other end. What you saw initially was just the tower. But we don't have control over the 
final outcome. We do the best we can, depends on the client where they want to listen to us more, they give us more clout working with a design institute. In some cases, design institute's very cooperative, in some cases they're not. We had a horrible time in Shanghai because the mayor had rejected the Design Institute scheme. And the hospital said, well, if it's rejected, you haven't been approved, we're not going to pay you for the design. So they were pretty angry to begin with, and they just, they were horrible to work with. And the building didn't turn out well. The interior functional layout, everybody loves, but just to finish this, everything's about it, it's not what we were proud of. Four stories, uh, atrium connecting all the floors of the outpatient clinic. All right, you're working with the uh, Southeast University, the Nanjing, and this is the biggest hospital in Jiangsu province. This was a design competition that started out with seven firms. We had one other U.S. firm that was in the competition, a firm from Singapore and so forth. The jury selected three, and then each of the three finalists were given the jury comments to make changes and come back, and the governor of the province was going to select the final scheme, and he picked us. And then when we got started on the design, he told the hospital, you can do anything you want to inside, but you can't change anything about this design. And we said, yes. <laughs> so we met with staff. We had user group meetings and so forth, but it was all just to refine what happened inside. Really interesting, comparing the designs, this was an existing campus with several buildings, and this is a neighborhood. I mean, it's full of apartments and people and so forth that had to be moved. But we were given the whole site to work with, and we oriented everything in the inpatient side to the south. We put the, di the uh, clinics here in a seven-story structure with light wells and ventilation wells in, a big atrium connecting them, but in terms of the site organization, across the street is a beautiful park. There's a little pagoda on top of the hill. And we thought, we want to invite that park into the site. The t two of the other schemes that were finalists put the building all the way out here and created internal green space, which is a concept in China. But it really appealed to the governor and also appealed to the jury that we were doing something to bring that park in. These are all terraced green spaces here because there's quite a grade change. And then all the parking goes underground. This has got three basement levels under it. And here's just a, a little 3D blow up. The diagnostic treatment areas connect with the clinics on every floor. All the waiting rooms are continuous here that feed into the clinics. This is a common entrance for all of the outpatients coming in for either diagnostics or the clinic, inpatients come in a separate way and have their own elevators to go up for family to go in and, and see the uh, patients. And then all the diagnostic and treatment is under the inpatient tower with horizontal connections to the clinics. This is a marvelous project. It hasn't, they've had diff construction difficulties because a third of the neighborhood was retired military and there was an old military hospital at the other end, and they just basically put their flag down and said, we're not moving. So the last we heard, there was really a standoff. In China, nobody owns land except the state, and the state can do what it wants to, but if you have connections, there can be enough political pressure and public pressure. So the hospital hasn't come back to us yet if we're going to have to redesign the end of it where the outpatient clinics are to make it taller and keep that neighborhood or not. Now, here's my bride. Like I said, she's been with me 10 times, and she's, I, I told her the presentation's too short for both of us to talk, but she said she'd keep me honest. This is, this is last October when we were going to Hangzhou. This was the second day the high-speed train was running. And we had an extra day in the schedule, and we said, gosh, let's go to Hangzhou. Let's take the train. We had been, the, time, the, tr the last time we'd been there together, we actually hired a car to come get us at the hotel and drive us to the hospital site because trying to take the old train or you know, trying to figure out how to get there, get from the train station to the hospital was just a nightmare. And it was just nice, but it took about two hours. This took 30 to 40 minutes. 
the cabin had a digital readout inside of the speed, and we got up maximum was 355 kilometers an hour. And you didn't even know you were moving. And this is the Hanzhou Binjiang Hospital, Binjiang meaning near the river. Uh, Hanzhou is famous for what's called the West Lake. It's probably one of our favorite cities in China. Mao used to vacation here all the time. And it's this gorgeous lake. There's a big river that runs south of the city, and it has canals that feed off of that. Well, we had one of the canals coming down beside the hospital site, and this was the city to the north, and all this new area to the south being developed with architectural controls, a lot of harmony. And the most important thing is the mayor wanted a landmark structure. And it had to be a hospital, but this hospital was being invested by the government. They wanted this symbol in Nanjing of the government's investment. Design competition narrowed it down to two. We were in the, uh, competing against a Japanese firm, and we won. And it was really interesting. This is the first time, well, not the first time, but we paid no attention to which way the patient rooms faced. <laughs> we just said, let's come up with something that just knocks your socks off, you know, at this corner. So it's 23 stories tall. All these are inpatient beds. This is a mall that runs all the way through with diagnostic and treatment on one side. The outpatient entrances here, all underground parking, inpatient entrances here, and even a third entrance around here for VIPs. And I'll show you that a little bit. The final design, we had to kill this edge and round it because the Chinese said, that knife edge is bad luck, bad feng shui. You know, it's leaking everything out, so we rounded it. And it turned out fine. But just things like that, you really do have to learn and respect, because it's important. And if it's important to them, it's important to us. When we started in China, I mean, the first time when we made these presentations at the Akati's office, we said, and if we have an opportunity to design anything in China, we absolutely will not adapt a U.S. solution. We'll spend the time to really learn what's unique, what works, what doesn't work, and incorporate what we know more about process than solutions. And everything has been unique. It pays attention to the site orientation, the separation of traffic internally, handling all these thousands of people coming in. And we've really been very successful. There's no other foreign firm in the world that has done as much work as we have, and I've been personally involved in every bit of it. And that's, I mean, it's not hard to say because we've done so much. Here's the plan of that facility. Rectangular block for the diagnostics and treatments in the clinics. You can see all of the waiting areas for outpatients organized along this mall. The main dining room for the public opens onto the mall into a garden. Outpatient entrance, here's the registration outpatient pharmacy. One of the things that we've been trying to get our clients to understand is appointments. In China, the clinics don't make appointments. Now, now that people have cell phones, it's going to be easier for them to notify and remind people, but when we started working in China, most people didn't have a telephone. It was on the street, and you would go down and actually have somebody dial the number for you, like going to a payphone. And none of the houses, I mean, you if somebody forgot an appointment, there's no way to contact. So everybody shows up in the morning at the same time. And you literally, like Baskin Robbins, pick a number. And then you pay in advance for what you need. And then you're told who to go see. And so you have to handle these mobs of people. Now, over time, that'll change. And I don't know what we'll do with all this other space. And here was the uh, inpatient and VIP entrance. But this is the first time that we really just paid no attention to the orientation. This all happened to be facing south, but this is facing north back toward the city and the river. All this faces south onto this new district and beyond that's really mostly agricultural land. But very western in terms of the double corridor scheme, central nurses station, this back corridor, again for staff and to keep all the supplies and everything out of sight. Because typically the old hospital inpatient units in China have all the patient rooms on the south side, 
and all the support space on the north side. So you open your patient room door and you look into the soil utility room. You know, so we've tried to be real careful to reorganize all of that. The VIP elevators would take you up and on several of the floors, this end was all private rooms and treated as a VIP unit for party officials, foreigners, you know, other than the normal, quote, public patients. Now this project, Sue, is Sue here? Yeah. Hey, <laughs> I don't think we've met. We just sent by email. But this was your, pro your thesis. This was the Infectious Disease Hospital in Shenzhen, and it was one of the first design awards that the Academy of Architecture for Health gave out. And this was in the unbuilt category, because at the time, it wasn't under construction. And it was in the north part of Shenzhen, the prevailing breezes came through, and as an infectious disease hospital, and this was post-SARS, so many cities were building infectious disease hospitals and leaving them empty just in case there's an outbreak. In Shanghai, there's a thousand bed hospital empty, and it's only gonna be used if there's a SARS outbreak. The government here said, uh-uh, we want it to be able to serve normal patients in that area and be available for an outbreak. So, respecting the Chinese tradition, we put all of the infectious areas to the north and the non-infectious areas to the south and let the winds and the breezes come through in between the buildings. And that was the driver behind the scheme. <clears throat> and then because these inpatient buildings are dedicated to different types of infectious disease, one that's airborne, one that's touch, one that's blood, there's no connection from any building to another not even in closed corridors, because they didn't want any possibility of airflow between one building and another. So we created these roof forms to sort of tie everything together and then put the mechanical equipment on the roof between the top of the building and these roof forms. Because everything had to be air conditioned, pressurized as an infectious disease hospital. This is just what anybody would see driving up. So it's always active, it's gonna have patients coming to it in normal times. You can see the organization here, the four inpatient buildings, the diagnostic and treatment and outpatient clinics in the center, a research facility, staff dormitories, education and dining, and all of this is on the south side, semi-infectious here and infectious here. But <clears throat> In a typical nursing unit, and this was really different because it doesn't meet fire codes in the U.S., we had a perimeter corridor that went around to the outside so the family could still come up and go and visit a patient by coming in from outside, and we used barred light through glass walls from the outside to the patient room. The staff came out, go through clothing change and gowning and scrubs, and all the staff areas are here in the staff corridor in the center, and as you come in to the room from the staff quarter, there is a gowning and scrub area again. So this complete separation of potential infection and, and sterile conditions. And again, we were, you know, we were delighted to receive one of the first honor awards. In fact, Wang Kai flew from Beijing to Chicago that July, and he and I received the award together. And the client healthcare bureau has a framed copy hanging on the wall. This is, when it's finished, will be the biggest single project, hospital project building in China. There's one that's gonna be a little bigger that's, if they get it built at RTKL has just won. But, but this is Ben Hai, which is near the sea, as opposed to Ben Zhang, which was near the river. This site looks across a botanic garden across the water to Hong Kong. Now, not the central area of all the high-rise buildings you see, but the North Territories. You couldn't ask for a more beautiful site. There's some really premier high-income housing right here. So the government said, we're going to let you build here, but it has to be 30 meters high maximum. So we don't obstruct the views of these important influential people uh, of the river. So... And furthermore, you can't build any healthcare 
within 200 meters of these residential. So we put education and research, administration and staff dormitories in this zone, and then we started all the healthcare zone 200 meters away. These are outpatient clinics with their contingent light and ventilation wells, the main entrance from the west, a mall in between the clinics and diagnostic and treatment, and then the inpatient towers facing south and east. This is a 300-bed VIP wing, all private rooms, separate minor surgery rooms, some imaging, still plugged into and sharing the major diagnostic and treatment core. But this has been a tremendous project. And when you I visited, I'll show you the construction in a minute. Here you see these bridge connections all the way through. One of the projects that I saw that was on the eye hospital had a similar concept in that the main entrance is at ground level for pedestrians and the public transportation will come into that parking lot but then vehicles go underground. There is a separate admitting office and reception area in each one of these clusters underground and parking underground right by it. The same is true of the outpatient clinics over here. It's so big and it had to be so spread out, it's 2,000 beds, that we had to develop clusters. So, for instance, we put all of the, uh, one more time, all the cardiopulmonary beds in a tower. We put all the ortho, neuro, rehab beds in another tower and we put all the oncology in another tower. And then the diagnostics that relate to them are nearby. So when they come across, and for the outpatients, all the cardiovascular clinics are together. So nobody's having to travel from one end to the other. I mean, this is two football fields long. So it's a long way. We, the client came to the US, we went to the Texas Medical Center and took him to see the new MD Anderson outpatient clinic and there's this huge bridge that goes back to the hospital. It connects to several other buildings. And they were driving these carts to haul people around. The client said, that's what we need. So these bridges that come across and these circulation spines have places to plug in electric vehicles. Now, there is one surgery suite that happens to take up the whole block, and it's 50 operating rooms. This mall down the center is open, covered, because Shenzhen is a tropical climate. And much like the Middle East, which is drier than this, this is moist, if you keep the sun off, it's much cooler. And then in the wintertime, it's delightful. So it didn't make sense to spend the energy to air condition this huge space. So all of these circulations along here that go into the clinics and to the diagnostic and treatment the balconies are all outside and then you go into enclosed waiting rooms. This is that west entrance and because the sun's coming from the west, we've got a sunshade system here and this is where the people would enter coming from public transportation. Here's the view of the west entrance and here it is under construction. I mean, this place is like going to a city when you go to the construction site. And then here is looking from the apartments over the hospital toward the sea. This is just a list of what we've done. I mean, since 1983, we've been paid for the design. This is not competitions we've lost for 1,400,000 square meters, which is almost 15 million square feet of space, and almost 11,000 beds. And again, there's no other foreign firm, and bragging a little bit, no other individual other than being in China, Dr. Wong, for instance, that's done that much work in China. It's just been a thrill. I would encourage you to learn Mandarin. <laughs> Even if you don't have any interest in China, you'll wind up associated with it in some respect. Half of the work that we got was direct commissions, half was competitions, even though they're bigger projects, and then competitions lost. So it divides it almost into a third, a third, and a third and that 20, 29 project. And I'm not going to go into that one, but uh, let me, what, how are we doing on time? All right, I'm going to show you something that I think is kind of neat. 
when you do design competitions in China, it's unlike any other thing we've ever done. We could not afford to do them in the U.S. We can come up with sketches and the concept and sketch-ups, but it's all produced by our, our Chinese partners. In this case, it used to be with Wang Kai, and uh, now it's with the Design Institute. Let's see where it went. There it is. So this is the kind of thing that we have to do that's turned in with each competition. Take that one. 